Hello, everyone. My name is Lynette Roach, and I'm the Media Relations Director with Black Health Matters. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Jenny Douglas. Dr. Douglas is a senior lecturer in health promotion in the Faculty of Wellbeing, Education, and Language Studies at the Open University. She established and chairs the Black Women's Health and Wellbeing Research Network at the university. Dr. Douglas has a PhD in women's studies and is an honorary member of the Faculty of Public Health and a director of the UK Public Health Register. She's also a member of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Race Equality Task Force. Her research is vast, spanning 30 years on issues of race, health, gender, and ethnicity. The key theme unifying her research and gender is exploring how race, class, and gender affect particular aspects of African Caribbean women's health. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Jenny Douglas here to talk about the state of Black women's health in the UK. On to you, Dr. Douglas. Thank you very much, Lynette. I um, thank you very much for inviting me and I'm delighted to join the Black Health Matters Global Summit. I'm joining you from Birmingham, UK, and you must have sent the sun because we've had a glorious weekend this weekend. So I'm going to talk to you about the state of black women's health in the UK. Okay, um, so hopefully you can see my um, slideshow. What I can't get it to do, I'm afraid, is to move forward. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to talk about African Caribbean women's health. My research has been about African Caribbean women in the UK. And um, the reason I've focused on African Caribbean women's health is that despite the increase in research that we've had um, on black and minority ethnic communities, African Caribbean women's health um, re our health is often ignored by health researchers and by policymakers. And I'm not quite sure why this is. Perhaps there's an assumption that we have large numbers of African Caribbean women working in the NHS, and therefore we have knowledge about our health and we are in control of our health. And um, in order to test this, I actually did some research where I took where I invited a group of African Caribbean women, some who worked in the NHS and some who didn't. And alarmingly and disappointingly, all the women had poor experiences of women's health, of health, whether they worked in the NHS or not. So, you know, working in the NHS doesn't mean that you are more aware of the systems and processes or about factors which influence your health. And we, we haven't had here in the UK an emphasis on research on black women and health like you have in the USA. And you know there doesn't seem to be that tradition. So here in the UK, the research on black women is very much on education, motherhood, employment and identity. However, there are a number of disparate health research projects which haven't received much attention. And most of the disparate research projects have come from black women, often black women who have worked in the NHS in different um, disciplines and have actually been quite horrified at the kind of experiences that black women have had. Um, and they have actually started to do pieces of research. So if we look at black women in the NHS, there is now a vast literature on how black nurses in the NHS were discriminated against when they first came to work in the NHS. Um, black women, a lot of black women came from the Caribbean during what we call the Windrush generation. So that is after 1948. Um, and in 1948, the National Health Service was established and it needed people actually to work and to develop 
the, the um, National Health Service. So there are many campaigns to actually recruit black women and some black men from the Caribbean to work in the NHS. Some black women came as nurses, some black women trained as nurses when they came to the UK. And what happened is that for many black women who trained as nurses in the UK, they were directed towards being trained as state enrolled nurses rather than state registered nurses. And this meant that this actually impeded their career prospects. So um, that, that was a real difficulty. So we still find even now that there are few black women in senior management positions in the NHS, well, I'm, although I'm pleased to say that the chief nurse actually is a black woman and we're starting to see some more black women having senior management positions. But what has been happening in the past is every time there's a reorganization of the NHS, particularly with the introduction of primary care trusts, it was used as an opportunity to displace black senior managers. So there are a number of health concerns in relation to African Caribbean communities, and I'm just gonna quickly go through some of them. African Caribbean people, that's both men and women, are five times more likely than average to have high blood pressure and twice as likely to die of stroke under the age of 65. African Caribbean people and mainly men are between three and six times more likely to be diagnosed with severe mental health conditions such as schizophrenia. Even though um, African Caribbean women experience a higher prevalence of hypertension than men, research by um, Gina Higginbottom actually showed that men are more likely to receive treatment. In um, Gina's study, she also um, linked, she saw the link of hypertension to particularly stressful work conditions and work experiences. And here in the UK, since the um, migration post-war, I say since 1948, many African Caribbean people have worked within public services like the National Health Services, social services, and transport services like British Rail. Um, and what, what, um, what has been their experience is that these kinds of employment is often characterized by low pay and shortage of staff. In addition, the stressful nature of working in such an organization may be compounded by racist attitudes of co-workers and line managers. And there's increasing research to show the institutionalized racism that black workers face. In relation to mental health, uh, I said that um, black men are more likely to be diagnosed with serious mental health conditions at a much higher rate than, than white men. What we have though is a, a paucity. We have a lack of research on mental health issues for black women for example, like anxiety and depression. And the stresses of everyday living and living in a racist society often takes its toll on African Caribbean women, having an overwhelming effect on their psychological well-being. But we have very little research on um, black women and mental health, and we need more research. Research has been done by, by Dawn Edge and colleagues at Manchester. Now I'll move quickly on to breast cancer. Um, again, a study, we, we have very little data on breast cancer and British black women. In a study that was conducted by Rebecca Bowen, she actually demonstrated that black women presented on average 21 years younger than white women. And that um, the tumors that black women had were considerably more aggressive and that black women were more likely, twice as likely to die of their disease. Despite this research then, we still haven't had more research on black women and breast cancer. We really, it's a real area that needs to be explored. There are lots of issues that are current concerns um, in, in, in relation to organ donation. 
we know that black people are three times as likely as the general population to develop kidney failure because black people have higher rates of diabetes and hypertension. Yet the donation rates in terms of organ donation are very much lower. If we look at sexual health and reproductive health, black women um, who, who wish to have in vitro fertilization have much lower pregnancy rates than white and Asian women. So this is an area that really needs much, much more exploration. And an issue that is of real concern at the moment in relation to black women. For a number of years, black women have been five times more likely than white women to die from complications in pregnancy and childbirth. That is five times more likely here in the UK where we have a national health service and we really need to start to ask questions about this. The research comes from um, Embrace at the University of Oxford. What we, um, what we can see is that in fact it's gone down very slightly. So in the report that was produced in January of 2021 this year, black women are 4.3 times more likely. And I would argue that one of the reasons for the slight reduction is the very admirable work that um, black women activists have been doing. Black women like the five times more campaign. And if we look at um, what's been happening in relation to black women and COVID, we can see that although black, Asian and minority ethnic communities make up 14% of the population, we actually make up 34% of people who have been critically ill from COVID. And black Asian, and, uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are twice as likely to die from COVID than their white counterparts. Sorry, I'm trying to, get, my slides keep sticking. Right, um, we know some of the reasons why black women are most likely to um, experience COVID is that they're at greater exposure to COVID because they're often frontline work, front workers, as I said, nurses, social workers, transport workers. And so they are much more likely to be exposed to COVID. Also, black women um, feel have felt that they need to go in, go into the workplace more. So if they're working, you know, within the NHS or within social care or within care homes, they have to go into work. And because of the institutional racism that I've already mentioned and workplace bullying within those environments, it doesn't actually allow workers to express and address their concerns about risk. And there are a whole, re a whole range of other reasons why there are complications from COVID. So once um, black women and black communities are infected with COVID, they are at, at a risk of having a more severe infection because they have underlying conditions like diabetes and obesity because I've, as I've said, these are more common in black women. And these, these conditions are not innate conditions. They are conditions that are caused by the socioeconomic position of black women. And the socioeconomic position is caused by the racism that they experience in, term, in terms of getting appropriate jobs, in terms of getting appropriate housing, in terms of getting appropriate education. And for many black, black women, um, especially those who are living in poorer areas, there's a higher incidence of chronic diseases that I've mentioned, and also multiple long-term conditions. So they may have many conditions together and they occur at a younger age. Research that's been done in the US by Arlene Geronimus talks about weathering. And Arlene Geronimus talks about the stress that is caused by day-to-day -day racism that black women experience. And that this day-to-day -day drip, drip, drip effect of racism actually causes um, black women 
to be older physiologically than their chronological age. And so in Arlene's work, she's been able to demonstrate that black women, and these are African-American women, but I'm sure the same is occurring in the UK, if only we did the research, black women are seven years older than their chronological age. In relation to um, black, Asian and minority ethnic pregnant women, um, we can see that half of the pregnant, half of pregnant women um, last year were actually admitted to hospital um, with COVID. So we've got 25% of Asian and 22% of black or other minority ethnic communities. So that we can actually see that not only is um, COVID affecting the population as a whole, it's specifically affecting black women and it's specifically affecting black pregnant women. So we can't ignore the impact of racism on our health. We know that race isn't biological, that race is a social construct, but also racism has biological consequences. In the US, um, there's a black women's health study based at Boston University. It commenced in 1985, so it's been running for over 25 years. And there were 59,000 African-American women enrolled on the study. And so 59,000 women have been followed over the last 25 years and they complete a questionnaire every two years. So there, there is a large amount of information on black women in the US and also how, how their health is progressing. And also the study looks at specific issues like lupus, sarcoidosis, breast cancer. We have nothing like that in the UK. We actually need a black women's health study here in the UK because we know that black women are dying from preventable diseases. We know that black women are dying from high blood pressure, strokes, coronary heart disease, diabetes, maternal mortality. Much of the research that's being done on women is being done on white women. We've all, all heard the joke, black don't crack, but black actually does crack. There are a number of conditions that are affecting us as black women and we have little information from about. And we have very few health studies here in the UK. It was for this reason that we set up the Black Women's Health and Wellbeing Research Network to bring together black women who are doing um, research and are doing it often in isolation, often on their own and unsupported. So we have a network, um, which is the Black Women's Health and Wellbeing Research Network. Over the years, we've had many conferences and seminars to raise awareness of health issues in black communities and particularly about black women. So please do have a look at our website. So just to conclude, the health of African Caribbean women in the UK is inextricably linked to our socioeconomic position, our work experience, our home life, and experiences of everyday racism. And we need more research. Often the research on race, ethnicity, and health only look at men, so they're gender blind, whereas studies which look at women and take a gender analysis tend not to look at black women, and so they are race blind. We need more research on the physical, psychological and emotional well-being of African Caribbean women, which pays attention to the intersection of race, gender and class and the complexity of black women's lives. And this research needs to be led by black women. Um, and just to my final slide, um, Leith Mullings and Amy Schultz argue that health disparities based on race and racism, class and gender and sexism are matters of life and, and death. And we are seeing this here in the UK. We are seeing, particularly in relation to things like maternal mortality, that black women are dying at rates of four to five higher than their white counterparts. And also in addition to that, underneath this kind of huge mountain, we have deaths at the top, but there is a whole mountain of morbidity. And it's that morbidity that we should be trying to do something about now. So thank you very much for listening. 
and I'm delighted to take questions. So let me um, stop sharing my screen. And let me look at the questions. Okay, so um, Colin Rock asks, do we know the reasons why black people and more black women are more likely to develop kidney failure? Well, we do know that black people and black women are more likely to have high blood pressure and hypertension and more likely to have diabetes. We're not absolutely sure because we need to do the research to look at why that should be the case. We do know that hypertension and diabetes are actually linked to um, socioeconomic position. Some people have argued that it's to do with lifestyle, but I would like us to move away from lifestyle. So often we as black people are blamed for our lifestyle. We are blamed, you know, um, for not eating the right foods, for drinking too much, for um, being obese, for not having enough exercise. But we have to put that within a political and socioeconomic context. You know, look at the sorts of jobs that black people are doing. You know, where is the time really to, to be able to take exercise? You know, black, black women in particular often have more than one job in order to sustain their family. And, you know, they are experiencing racial discrimination at work often and often, um, you know, living in environments, living in places where they experience racial discrimination where they live. So I think we need more research to actually look at all of these com complexities. Okay, my website details, I will, I will try and put that into the chat later. And what is my view on clinical trial participation? That's Janine. Um, oh, right. Oh, Elsie's just, sorry, I'm just looking at the um, chat as well, that our chief nurse isn't a black woman. Okay. Um, uh, my view on clinical trial participation is that I think we need to be much more aware of what clinical trials are actually taking place. Um, and um, we, and armed with appropriate information on clinical trials, I do feel that we should actually participate in clinical trials. Because if we do not participate in clin clinical trials, um, there is not the information on black and minority ethnic communities in order to develop appropriate interventions. I know that, you know, we have had a very troubled past in relation to the way that different, um, that we, we as black communities, both in the UK and in the US have been used in different, um, to, to actually look at the impact of different pharmaceuticals on our health. We're all aware of the way that Depo-Provera, um, an injectable contraception, was given to black women in the 1970s without their knowledge and without their, um, their kind of consent. And that also the same, um, the same contraceptive was actually tested in Jamaica. So we do have to make sure that we are fully aware of what the clinical trial is, who, um, who else is participating, so that, but we should very much um, participate. So the Food Foundation says, what do you think the cultural barriers in the city to tackling health inequalities? Um, I think that in Birmingham, we, we do have um, a large population of black and minority ethnic communities and a large population of Caribbean um, communities. I think that because of the, the, the experiences that black communities have had in relation to health, in relation to discrimination within the health service and discrimination within other institutions, we are, we are as black communities necessarily skeptical 
about working with different organisations. But I think that we now need to work with um, a range of organisations in order to tackle health inequalities. And I think that, that as black people, we should, um, we should make sure that that work is led by black people. I'm um, looking at the question answer, but I can also see there are lots of questions in the chat. Um, and I'm just going to, so there's one question in the chat. How do you suggest non-academics be recognized for their work in repairing the discrimination and inequalities and their voice in other generic research is often not recognized or given credit. And I think it's really important that, that as research, as people involved in research, we recognize the contributions that everybody has to play and that we work um, across um, participation by a whole range of sectors and, and people, because we really need, um, we really need to work together in order to affect change. I think that one of the difficulties that we have in, in here in the UK and that we don't have in the US to the same extent is that academic institutions tend to be very separate and do not work with the voluntary sector, with third sector organisations, with um, professional organisations, with community organisations. And what we really need to do is to make sure we get that dialogue going between the, the, the academic institutions and between community organisations. We really have to work together in order to address inequalities because these inequalities are not getting better. These inequalities are getting worse and, and we all should be working together to address them. So I think, let me just check if there's anything. I think I've got two more minutes left. I would just say, um, please do. I mean, if you Google um, the Black Women's Health and Wellbeing Research Network, you will find our network. Um, we actually have a webinar coming up on Thursday. And um, what we've been trying to do is to develop conversations across the Atlantic. So in March, we had a conversation with people from the Black Women's Health Study in the US, from the Black Women's Health Imperative in the US, and with Mother Lab in the US. Um, on Thursday, we'll be having a conversation with um, a black woman researcher in Canada and black women researchers in Trinidad and in Jamaica, because we really need to, um, to make sure that, that, that we are working, not just across the sectors in the UK, but that we're working transnationally, because a lot of the, the health issues that we face here in the UK are actually faced in Canada, America, and in the Caribbean, although there may be different reasons. Okay, so um, I will end it there. Thank you very, very much for your participation. Thank you very much for your really interesting questions and um, do enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you, take care.